Let me show you an image. Please take a look and tell me if you can see yourself there. We hold a lot. Sometimes we are holding so much that it feels like everything is about to fall. And sometimes we become so good at holding that it doesn't feel like anything is going to fall, but it doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. So while asking questions about holding, let me take you to a liminal holding moment in our story. Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai holding the tablets in his hands and sees the people of Israel worshiping an idol. At that moment, it suddenly becomes too much. Can you imagine what runs through his mind? Why am I doing this? Does anyone value my efforts? Couldn't they just do their part? Couldn't they wait? Next scene, the tablets are on the ground. Interestingly, the word that Torah uses is by shlech, from his hand, exactly as we did last week, the shlich. We don't know if Moses threw the tablets, if they slipped, if they were dropped, if they just became too heavy. There are many interpretations of how and why, but the outcome was that the tablets ended up shattered on the ground. This moment of brokenness was a turning point for both, for Moshe and for the Jewish people. It changed them. It is a common situation to find ourselves holding something very, very heavy or holding too many things. We take the first thing and then one more and then one more and so on. Can you see them piling up? Some things we hold on to consciously and some we don't even know, we don't even realize that we are holding. If we are very good at this, after a while, we just keep holding without thinking about it. We keep holding because that's what strong people do. That's what good people do. Now, think about the picture of the pile of boxes that becomes so, so high that it's covering your face and you can't see anything anymore. Your hands are tied. You can't go forward. You can't go backward. You can't really move. If you change anything, something will fall. So you hold it together. When you are so tied up, the only thing that you can really do is to remind yourself that you are holding. But there is no motion there. No physical motion, no intellectual motion, and I would dare and say no spiritual motion either. And where there is no place for motion, there is no place for growth. The reality is that the only thing you are holding is a formula for physical, intellectual, and spiritual atrophy. Dr. Dolly Chug from uh, NYU, who studies ethical behavior, talks about the psychology of good people and explains that sometimes we need to let go of being a good person in order to become a better person. Who is that better person? Well, that better person is the one who has space for erring, for adapting, learning, growing, changing. It is a person who has the ability to choose what to hold and certainly the ability to let go. Just 10 days ago, we started the month of Tishrei. Now, the first month of the year is Nisan, which is when we celebrate Passover. The month of Tishrei 
is actually the seventh month of the year. So what does Rosh Hashanah mark? In Rosh Hashanah, we acknowledge the creation of humanity. The Kabbalah tells that in order to create the world, God, being the infinite, had to contract itself and make a space for different entities with free will. God's act of contraction and release, Tzimtzum, allowed for the existence of something new. Of course, when our Mekubalim mystical thinkers described this process of creation, they were thinking about the same process that they knew from nature, breaking the water, contractions. They are all elements involved in the upbringing of something new. But these motions aren't painless. And while we know that the ad outcome is a joyful one, the process involves discomfort, pain, and tears. Now let's get back to the number seven. Seven symbolizes letting go in order to allow the space for something holy. That describes the seventh day of creation, and of course, the seventh year, which is the year of Shemitah, by definition, letting go. The agricultural meaning side of Shemitah means a year in which we leave the land to rest. Today we know that that time is vital in order to allow natural cleaning and regeneration. But actually, letting go, even when we know that it can be healthy and productive, is something that we really struggle to grasp. It might be because it challenges our notion of certainty. It might be because we tend to think that we are what we hold. But if there is something that the story of creation is here to remind us, is that the world is an unfolding and evolving creation. That's why we have days of creation as opposed to a single event. That's also why this world was created in order to continue to be created. And that work was given to us, to human beings. And guess what? It starts by internalizing that we are also creators of our own lives. But in order to fulfill that principle and approach our existence with the creativity that ignites life, we need some vulnerability, some humility. We need some space. Every time we return the Torah to the Ark, and also during the Slichot, we pray the famous verse from Lamentations. Ashivenu Adonai Elecha ben Ashuva, return us to you, O God, and we will return. Hadesh Yameinu Kekedem, renew our days as in days of old. What does it mean, renew our days? What does it mean? Sometimes we think, I want to get back to when I was 18 years old or when I was 25 years old. Maybe the days in which our marriage was good or the days in which that was the way I loved it or this was the way I wanted it. But do you really think that renewing our days means to go back in history? And so, what are those days of old? Kekedem. The word kekedem refers to gan edem mikedem, the beginning of existence, the place in which it is clear that our paths are yet to be shaped. There we understand that our souls are pure and that life is waiting for us. So Hadesh Yameinu Kekeden, renew our days as in days of old, means help me understand that life can be renewed. But one more layer of the word Kedem is that 
it also shares its root with the word le'it kadem, to move forward, renew our days as days of old, give us the opportunity to renew our lives, to look at our lives with new eyes, to learn new things, to grow, to make new commitments. Help me approach the world with awe, help me find motion, so I don't find myself only stagnant in holding to what I already know. Help me reset so I can experience growth and move forward. On Yom Kippur, we don't ask for our hands to become bigger so we can hold more. If we are not even sure what is that that we are holding, what is that that we are doing with our lives. Just because holding is what we do, it doesn't mean that it is a good thing, my friends. We rather ask for life to be renewed, for life to be meaningful. We ask for purpose. And so we need contraction and space. Now, in order to learn to let go, we might need to challenge some of our definitions, some of our own cynicism and judgment. We need to put ourselves in front of a mirror and to be willing to experience the pain of letting go and to embrace the uncertainty of redefining, of rearranging, of rethinking, of reimagining. When Moshe drops or lets go of the tablets, a new thing happens. All of a sudden, Moses becomes vulnerable. In that moment, they all understand that there are things that will need to change to be let go for all of them in order to be able to start a new life. And that moment of insight would not have been possible without the smashed tablets. Now, new tablets had to be inscribed. I would dare and say that not just new, but even better tablets were going to be inscribed. Our tradition tells us that the day that Moshe finally came back down with the new covenant was the 10th day of the month of Tishrei. Or in other words, Yom Kippur, Yomer Adonai Salach Tikid Barecha, and God said, per your request, I have forgiven you. Yom Kippur symbolizes for us as a people, but also for each of us as individuals, the opportunity to make new covenants, to find a path forward, to renew our lives. I want to take you back to the description of the moment we started our conversation with, the moment in which the tablets become impossible to hold and Moses is about to drop them. I want to invite you to contemplate what you have in your hands. What are the things that need to be reaffirmed? What are the things that need to be put aside? What are the things that need to be let go? We are praying for renewal, but by now we know that it doesn't happen without contractions and growing pains. Don't run away from that pain. During this Yom Kippur, again and again, as we pray for renewal, think of what you need to release, what you need to let go of. If you start feeling the contractions and the growing pains, take them as a sign that you are moving forward and that there is new life waiting for you. Try to put in your mind, for a moment, the image of the tablets hitting the ground. Overwhelmed with emotion and fear, Moses' eyes must have been closed or full of tears, or both. The Talmud tells us that in that moment, God whispered in Moses' ear, Ishar Koach, 
well done. They needed to be broken. Something new was born in that moment. In this Yom Kippur, I pray for all of us to find the strength and the courage to let go. Even though we know that that motion, that that contraction can be terribly painful. I pray that we don't run away from that important work, as difficult as it may be. We pray that this Yom Kippur will truly be an opportunity for us to bring the spirit of our prayers closer to the reality of our lives so we can renew our days and move forward to life renewed. And while we are doing this work, and we close our eyes, we might hear God's voice telling us, Shar Koach, they shall be broken. Hatimatova, everyone.